which should never be lived in. So the million dollar question, what about a shower? Well, Harrison goes to the gym or goes to the office to shower and he plans to live in his dumpster for a year, but he's open to staying longer or relocating his blinged out bin if the occasion calls for it, Andrew and Liz. I don't know if I could do it, but I guess that's why they call it a trash can, not a trash can. <laughs> that's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great day, everyone. It's Tuesday, March 7th. They crossed the border and haven't been seen since. We start here. A group of Americans are kidnapped on their way into Mexico. There are shootouts between rival groups in that city all the time. This type of trip is not unique either. What it means for security measures now in each country. It could have been President Biden's first veto. Instead, he says he'll go with Republicans on this one. It was just deeply unpopular with the populace that's been experiencing rising crime. How urban crime has upended pre-election politics. And Russia is ready to take back a Ukrainian city. They've forced Russia to expend ammunition, lose men. But as it costs Vladimir Putin more rubles and Russian lives than it's worth. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. As much as we talk about people coming from Mexico into the U.S. to live, the fact is that in border towns, travel is not one way. Every day, nearly a million people cross the border legally. 350 million people a year. That's trucks carrying goods. That's employees going to work. And, of course, tourists. The difference here is that Mexican tourists need a visa to come here. Americans going to Mexico do not. And because of this, there are entire industries in Mexico devoted to Americans crossing over for the day or just the afternoon. Some of these are services that aren't legal here. The others are just simply easier to obtain or just cheaper there. Four people who are now missing, even feared kidnapped in Mexico. You know, they were just slamming them on the truck like they were dead dogs. Well, yesterday we learned that four Americans crossing into Mexico were allegedly dragged out of their cars at gunpoint and kidnapped. They've not been heard from since, and this has created a flashpoint for Mexican and American authorities. Let's go straight to ABC's Matt Rivers, who's based in Mexico City. Where was this exactly, Matt? Yeah, this is a city called Matamoros. It's in a state called Tamaulipas. That state borders South Texas. So the city of Matamoros is just about 12 miles or so from the city of Brownsville, which is right in the southern part uh, of Texas. And what we're learning from authorities, we, we first learned something was going on here on Friday afternoon, where we knew that there was some kind of a shootout, some kind of major violence in Matamoros that afternoon, which isn't unfortunately all that uncommon. This is an area that is very violent. Drug cartel fueled violence has plagued this area for years and years and years now. But then as the weekend goes on, by Sunday evening, the FBI puts out a statement. They say that actually four Americans have been kidnapped directly related to that violence that we heard about mm -hmm. on Friday evening. They say that four U.S. citizens crossed the border from Brownsville into Matamoros uh, driving a white minivan with North Carolina plates and that armed men came carrying large rifles, wearing body armor. They then kidnap those four Americans and their status to this day, we don't know where they are or how they're doing. Video that starts circulating on social media that ABC can't completely verify, but we know the FBI is using this video as a part of their investigation. In this video, you see one of these Americans being pulled up into a pickup truck bed. Then you see another person being dragged into the pickup truck bed. They're not moving. And another person lays on the ground, not moving at all. That person then left on the ground as that pickup truck drives away. Fast forward to Monday afternoon. ABC News learns about the families of some of these victims. We managed to get in contact with the mother of one of the victims, a woman named Latavia McGee goes by the nickname Tay. Mm. Her mother says that Latavia and her three traveling companions, Shaid Woodward, Zendel Brown, and Eric Williams, they left from the East Coast, from South Carolina, went to Mexico because Latavia was getting plastic surgery somewhere in Mexico. So she travels with these three other people. They cross into Mexico, and eventually Latavia's mom finds out the, the FBI contacts her and says, hey, we believe your daughter has been kidnapped along with the people that you're, she's been traveling with, and that brings us to where we are right now.
Are authorities giving a reason for why this might have happened or why these Americans might have been targeted? So we're not sure whether they were targeted specifically or not. What the Mexican mm. government has said is they were caught up in a shootout between armed groups. Now, whether they were some kind of a part of that or whether they were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, we don't know. But what I can tell you from years of covering the border is that these places are incredibly dangerous. It is entirely possible that these people crossed the border at the wrong time because there are shootouts between rival groups in that city all the time. We're standing ready to provide all appropriate uh, consular assistance. We do also remind Americans about the existing travel guidance when it comes to this uh, particular part of Mexico. The, travel the U.S. State Department has rated the state of Tamaulipas, which is where Matamoros is, they've rated that state as a level four do not travel. You know where else they give out those ratings to, that level four rating? Syria. Afghanistan, wow. North Korea. So they're not messing around when they put out a level four rating, and that is how they've classified this part of Mexico. It is an incredibly dangerous place. Well, and how are the respective governments kind of characterizing this? Because like, we've heard about violence along the border for a long time. We've heard about cartels. We've heard about Americans being victims of crimes when they go to Mexico. None of that is particularly new, and yet these governments seem to be responding to this kidnapping. Maybe it's because it's a kidnapping, but very, very urgently. 100%. And, and it's not normal that just because an American is involved in a crime in Mexico that the FBI goes very public with it. Um, but that is what we're seeing in this case. The Departments of State and Homeland Security are also coordinating with Mexican authorities, and we will continue to coordinate uh, with Mexico and push them for, uh, to bring those responsible to justice. We're seeing that FBI put out a $50,000 reward for any information leading to the safe return of these four Americans, as well as to the arrests of those responsible here. Sí, pero ya se está we saw Mexico's president talk about it at his daily press conference on Monday morning saying that he's instructed his government to work with U.S. authorities to get these people back safely. So there's no question that both governments feel a sense of urgency here. Can we talk about, you said that these were people going from the east coast of the U.S. down through, like across the south through Texas to get plastic surgery. I mean, how common is that? And what does that kind of tell us about these, I guess, industries along these border towns? Yeah, sure. As strange as that might sound to some people who aren't familiar with the border, you know, that kind of cross-border economy uh, is quite common. People who live in the border areas, oftentimes they don't view both sides of the border as two distinct communities. They really look at it as one community with a border that happens to run through the middle of it. And so what you do in those situations is you take advantage of the advantages that you might have on the other side. So for example, if you live in El Paso, Texas, you might say, I actually, I can get a prescription my medication a bit cheaper if I cross the border to Ciudad Juarez. Well, the same thing applies to plastic surgery. If you go to San Diego and you cross the border into Tijuana, you're going to see advertisements all over the place for plastic surgery. The simple fact mm. is it's a lot cheaper to get that nose job or that facelift in Mexico than it is oftentimes in the United States. And that does appear to be uh, what at least one of these victims was doing, accompanied by her friends. The thing is that while you have many, many different businesses across the border that are catering to these sorts of plastic surgery seekers, these cities are also very, very dangerous places. And so when you come across the border, go to these cities to look for cheaper plastic surgery, you are putting yourself at risk by doing so. There's no question. And you're seeing that as an example in this particular case. Yeah, it's so interesting. We talk about the, the risks as far as like unregulated industries, but these are risks just as far as getting to the clinic itself. All right, uh, Matt Rivers, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Next up on Start Here, D.C.'s got a plan to fix policing, and now President Biden's got a headache. We're back in a bit. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. <laughs> 
you want a sense of how intense debates over crime have become, consider this. Yesterday outside Atlanta, the protest against the construction of a police training site on a piece of forest land resulted in dozens of arrests. We say no to Cop City, and we say no to this history. Police allege that protesters began throwing rocks, then bricks, then fireworks and Molotov cocktails. Eventually, a truck was set on fire. This was a very violent attack that occurred this evening. Very violent attack. And this wasn't about a public safety training center. This was about anarchy, and this was about the attempt to destabilize. In addition to the environmental concerns, a lot of these activists have said the fundamental problem here is how much latitude we give to police, that we're willing to devote pristine land to this institution that's caused what they see as so much harm over the years. This protest represents the extreme, but it is clear there are voters out there that are tired of so-called tough-on-crime politicians. But yesterday, we got another sign that even among Democrats, those are not the voters out there concerning them the most. In fact, when the City Council of Washington, D.C. voted to change their crime policies, national lawmakers decided they had to undo those reforms, and it doesn't look like President Biden's about to stop them. ABC's Trish Turner joins us from the nation's capital. And Trish, I always forget this, but Washington, D.C., it's got a mayor, it's got a city council, but its funding all comes from Congress, right? Like, they set the rules. How did this blow up this week? Yeah, that's exactly right, Brad. So D.C., like you said, has its own government, but ultimately, under our laws, it's Congress who has the final say. So final review, if you will, and it's called home rule. So they're basically able to come in, um, federal lawmakers come in and they say if they don't like something that D.C. has done, you know, they can come in and reverse it. And so that's exactly what we saw this week. Well, and this seems applicable to a lot of places because so many big blue cities are trying to figure out their approach to crime rates right now. What was this plan? Basically, D- the D.C. Council, they've been working for about 16 years. I mean, I live in this city. I've been reading about this forever. They've been trying to change the criminal code to sort of bring it up to modern day. It hasn't been changed since 1901. So they've been working for about 16 years to, you know, sort of tweak some of the maximum penalties for burglary, carjacking, robbery. They were really, really high, and they were concerned about first-time offenders. Countless meetings, hard collapse collaboration and compromise and thoughtful engagement by a wide range of stakeholders, all of which might disagree with a particular element of the total package, but unanimously recommended moving it forward nonetheless. There was a lot of controversy stirred because mandatory minimum sentences for certain things were scrapped. They expanded jury trials for misdemeanors. It was just deeply unpopular with the populace that's been experiencing rising crime. We know that members of the community have been rightfully angry and frustrated about the violence happening here. And And remember, lawmakers live in the city. Their staff, their constituents come for visits. They're staying in the city. They're experiencing what feels like rising crime. Now, very technically, we've looked at the stats. Crime is actually going down a little bit in the city. But like everywhere in the pandemic, it was really high. And one thing that we all can agree to, uh, that people across all eight wards uh, want us to do more to focus on guns and getting guns out of our community. But they also want to make sure that we're holding people accountable uh, who hurt our city. Mayor Bowser, D.C. Mayor Bowser vetoed it. So she knew the deeply unpopular nature of this bill for a lot of folks in this city. And then Congress just came along. First of all, it was Senate Republicans, House Republicans. They have a way to reverse um, D.C. legislation. It will only serve to embolden criminals who are on a massive spree right here in Washington with carjackings, assaults and homicides. That's why I'm leading the Senate resolution to block this bill. Senate Republicans, they devised this resolution, and lo and behold, there there were some Democrats who decided to go along. But, you know, ultimately, we're going to see a vote on Wednesday. But Biden, just so I'm clear, though, I I get that Republicans got a couple Democrats to come along with them, so whatever. But Biden could veto this if he wanted to, right? Why doesn't he? That is exactly right. He surprised us. In a closed-door lunch last week, he told Senate Democrats... I am going to side with Republicans. I'm not going to veto this. He said that very clearly, and we heard it very loud and clear. And uh, 
I clap, I clap very loudly because I feel the same. And so that opens the door even wider. That gives cover to Democrats. A number of them are up in red states this cycle. Gives a lot of cover to these guys to just say, uh-uh, can't go along with this. One thing that the president believes in is say, making sure that the streets in America and communities across the country are safe. That includes D.C. That does not change. That's why It's a really tricky political issue, Brad. So you brought up the issue of being tough on crime. A lot of cities really fed up with this whole fight. But we have seen Democrats get really battered about by this issue of being soft on crime. The Democratic Party, they have a majority. They could stop this crime today. Our local officials cannot defund our police. And our prosecutors cannot be soft on crime. The issue that I hear about a lot from New Yorkers is that they care about wanting to be able to feel safer on the streets. It's one of the most potent labels in the last political cycle. We saw New York Democrats lose, you know, like sweeping losses across the state. And then we saw Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. She was tossed out, didn't even win her primary. Right. So it's just a it's a really potent political issue. And even Nancy Pelosi, former speaker, she saw the writing on the wall and, you know, and she she said, this is a fight that's about soft on crime and, you know, should have seen this coming. They don't do this often. They do it sparingly. And so the first time in 30 years, with the help of the majority of Democrats, a lot of Democrats, Republicans are going to prevail here. And President Biden is going along. Yeah, it just sort of shows you where this debate on crime is going to be like in 2024. You even have big city mayors like Eric Adams in New York City essentially saying, like, we're being too easy, not too tough on criminals right now. Uh, Trish Turner, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. A few weeks ago, you might remember our foreign correspondent Patrick Rievel described this phenomenon unfolding in Ukraine where some of these battles are being waged by groups of Russian mercenaries, many of them convicts released from prison just to fight. The town they were eyeing at that moment was Bakhmut in the eastern part of Ukraine. Well, right now, Bakhmut is now virtually surrounded by Russians, leading many to say it's not a matter of if Bakhmut falls, but when. Let's go to ABC's foreign correspondent, James Longman, who's in that part of the country, in Dnipro. And James, for months, the narrative was that Russia is now losing the land that it had taken early on in the war. It sounds like that might not be the case, right? What, what's happening there now? Well, that's right. So Bakhmut, to set the scene, pre-war had about 75,000 people living there and its population. And in many ways, it's one of these cities that is kind of a gateway to the rest of the Donbass. So strategically, for the Russians, it's not massively important in and of itself, but it would give them a platform to uh, launch attacks on much larger cities, which would be very, very important for them, cities like Kramatorsk and Slovyansk. Um, but above all, I think, for the Russians, this would be a significant propaganda boost. I mean, they haven't had a major win in something like eight months, and so they need it. They, they need this to show not just the world, but, you know, their own people back home in Russia that this was worth the fight, even though strategically it's not that important. But what's fascinating about Bakhmut is it's become a kind of politically significant place for Russia because of the internal dynamics in Moscow. You have two major Russian fighting forces here. You have the regular standing army, Russian, the Russian military, and you have Wagner Group. These are the mercenaries that Russia pays to fight its wars. And basically what happened was the guy who runs Wagner, Yevgeny Prigozhin, said to Putin, your guys aren't getting back moot. I can go in there. Let me do it. My guys can do it. Mm. And what's happened is he hasn't been able to win this particular battle and so blaming it on Moscow. So what Bakhmut has become is over and above its strategic value on the battlefield, it's become this kind of political football. But now it seems that finally uh, Prigozhin's promise, even though it's come late, may actually be coming true. And he is uh, succeeding along with Russian standing army uh, troops in surrounding the city. We understand that it might be that there are Russian forces currently in the northern suburbs of Bakhmut. Uh, a number of bridges have been destroyed. That might be the, the Ukrainians blowing them up, because that's what happens when you uh, withdraw from a city, or it might be the Russians blowing them up. But either way, it does look like it's a question of uh, uh, when and not if. Wait, then, James, if, if you're saying Bakhmut is not actually that important, the Russians are spending a whole lot of energy on something that's not not the most strategically important city. It's just a PR win for them. And you know Bakhmut eventually is going to fall. If you're the Ukrainians, why stay and fight this out so hard? We, we thought they might even give up the city over the weekend. 
That hasn't happened. No, again and again, the Ukrainians have said, absolutely not, we won't, we're going to stay, don't listen to the Russian propaganda, we're fighting. We are defending and will continue to defend every part of Ukraine. When the time comes, we will liberate every city and village of our country. And actually, we've had an update very recently from a senior Ukrainian general uh, saying that uh, there are more reservists are going to back mood. Mm. But the thing is, is that the whole message from the Ukrainians is we will fight for every shred of our land, every inch. We won't succeed to the Russians. Um, we've had visits there from senior members of the Ukrainian uh, government and military who visited the kind of area around Bakhmut. So for them, it's become symbolically massively important, but actually also strategically important because they've been able, they say, to exhaust Russia in so many ways. They've forced Russia to expend ammunition, lose men, mm. uh, just sink enormous amounts of resource into Bakhmut and in the meantime heavily fortify the area around it. So whilst Bakhmut may fall, what the uh, Ukrainians have been able to do is go to towns and cities nearby and heavily fortify them and, and they've used this time well. So that has been, it looks to be, the Ukrainian strategy thus far. There would be a criticism of this saying, well you've wasted a lot of men, you've wasted a lot of uh, resources, you've paid a heavy, heavy price if this has been your strategy. But what's been fascinating to watch in Bakhmut is the kind of modalities of warfare, because on the one side you have Russia with these kind of World War II tactics, carpet bombing entire areas, bringing down entire apartment buildings, constant, constant bombardment with artillery. In fact, they, they, they've used fighter planes in Bakhmut, just bombing as much as they can, total war. And on the other side, you've had Ukraine which has been much more surgical uh, about this, using drones to draw out uh, Russian troops and then hitting them with artillery, uh, going after the leadership, uh, scoping out where Russians are in their positions and going after them. So um, it has been, it's crystallized really, a lot of the dynamics that are happening all over the country. And Ukraine has been able to uh, to fight this war on its terms in Bakhmut. At least that's what they say. Yeah, it sounds like extracting those costs that the Russians are willing to pay. Like, th that that's almost the strategy here, thinking that the more casualties the Russians endure, the more the pressure actually grows in places like Russia, in Moscow, as people continue wondering whether any of this is worth it. All right, James Longman, they're in Dnipro, Ukraine. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Brad. All right, one more quick break. When we come back, do you want to build a snowpack? One last thing is next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. America's Next Top Model, a global phenomenon. Ciao. I could not believe the things that came out of those people's mouths. Watching back this show, it didn't age well. No. What in the cultural appropriation? I didn't think so much in it. I didn't think right. anything it was about it either. Now I'm like, hello. It's a reality show. America's Next Top Model, 20 years later. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And one last thing. You've probably seen pictures in the last few days showing just how much snow Californians have been experiencing. Never been in this much snow in my life. A few days ago, we were standing on top of our cars, shoveling them out, but our road is just too packed in to even leave past this point. Some Southern California officials have admitted they were unprepared for the intensity of two back-to-back -back snowstorms, which have left some residents stranded for up to a week as supplies dwindle. I'd gladly go down the hill and get stuff for my neighbors and for myself, but I don't know if I can get back up. 
up to my wife who has medical issues. It's not right. And yet if there was one upside to all of this, the thinking was at least California's record-setting drought is finally over. Think about last week where you had just three days and you got 100 inches in the mountains outside of Los Angeles, so the San Bernardino Mountains. That's a big deal for a place like Southern California because their water primarily comes from that type of snow, their rain, and then the Colorado River Basin. Like ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z has been keeping an eye on water levels in California for years, and she says snow is a key factor to keeping water flowing all year round. Unbelievable to watch the snowpack, which, by the way, is now at 190% of normal for the whole state of California. And yet, she says, this is not the end of the story, not even close. We will get these extreme wet and cold seasons in a place like California, but then it'll be followed by a longer stretch of hot and dry. And so you'll quickly evaporate everything that fell. Ginger says because overall temperatures are continuing to rise around the world, around the state, here's what's about to happen. Snow is going to melt a little faster than years past. That new water in the soil will fill reservoirs, but it'll also contribute to the growth of tons of plants, which sounds nice, but because the air is warmer, those plants will grow faster and then dry out quicker than they used to. As those plants dry out quickly, because it is so hot and so dry in the next couple of seasons, inevitably, they're going to burn fast. And you're going to have huge wildfire seasons because you just created a bunch of starters for fires. Oh, like the extra water followed by the dryness would actually create more fires, you're saying? Yes, and as we have seen in huh. the last couple of decades has proven, even when we get a helpful season, and we'll call it that, it is really difficult to rebound fully because we're, put, we're in a place right now, because of human-induced climate change, amplifying those natural cycles, that the resilience to drought is just not there. And that's the trouble with these huge flash weather events. It's tempting to say, how bad can climate change be if L.A. is getting snow? Well, not only does it lead to more severe weather events in the future, but huge rains and huge fires every couple years that gets more heat, more drought, strip soil. It gets harder for everything to bounce back. So what kind of snowstorms would be helpful? Well, just head down to the coast and ask any California surfer what they'd prefer. A solid set with waves spaced evenly apart or one huge bubble? Bomb that could batter you. It's really gnarly up in those mountain towns right now. Hey, it's come to my attention that one of our loyal listeners has a birthday today. Dylan from Jacksonville. Thank you so much for starting here. I truly hope you have a great day. By the way, my mother-in-law's birthday was yesterday, but she doesn't listen. So, like, Dylan, you get all the shout-outs. A reminder, you can always follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Start Here ABC. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front.